to be here. Thank you so much, Salome, as well. I really appreciate it. So, yeah, I can't wait to discuss with you all. Kidoa is an organization I have definitely been following for many years, and it's so amazing to see that it's reached 20 years. And I really think like Kidoa is the center, really, for a lot of other anti racism organizations have, that have followed beyond that. So, thank you, Salome, and so many others for starting that so many years ago as well. So yeah, if Alana could share my presentation, please. Yep. Yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about intersectional feminism. And it's something that we do hear about from time to time, but we never really discuss it properly, especially in the Irish context. And I want to discuss why we actually need allyship from white Irish women as women of African descent. So discussing first intersectionality, so this is broadens the lens of the first and second wave feminism. So arguably focuses on experiences of women who were both white and middle class. So intersectionalism includes the different experiences of women of color, women who may be from poor backgrounds, immigrant women and other groups as well. So a class has a lot to do with it too. So I want to look today at women of Ireland today. Who are the women of Ireland today? When you think of women of Ireland today, what comes into your mind? Then I want to look at how we can help each other and why we're stronger together. So I hope for an Ireland of unity where all women can stand together and fight struggles together as women not erasing but acknowledging our differences whether that's race sexuality and class so it's really important i feel to really acknowledge these things you know it's all good and well to say oh we're all human we will all bleed the same color yes but there are so many differences to us as well and that needs to be celebrated and acknowledged and then the future of feminism so what does the future of feminism look like when you hear the word feminism what even comes to your mind do you think feminism is just for white women and i'm also going to be looking at womenism and also third wave feminism as well that came in the 90s which accumulated to black feminism coined by alice walker oh sorry Ola. i think uh, you're muted for some reason I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you're fine. Guys. Yeah, so culture and national identity, Benedict Anderson in Magic Communities, this would have been a text that I would have studied in college. And it's really looking at Irishness. How, how did Irishness evolve? What does Irishness mean of the past and now the present? And then also looking at duality as well. I think it's really important when we talk about identity issues to recognize that there are a lot of us, like myself, in particular. Uh, for example, that grew up in Ireland, but I have that duality of being Nigerian as well. So the struggles between the two, the cultures, you know, what's expected of women, you may, maybe in the Nigerian context to what's expected of women in the Irish context. So sometimes they can clash. Multiculturalism was late in Ireland compared to the rest of the Western world. So for the last 20 odd years, Ireland has been infused with lots of different diversity and it's only now that we're catching up with this. Now we're actually recognizing that we're a diverse nation. Now we're, are, we're advocating for more representation, whether that's in media, politics, our classrooms, whatever it is. And then if you don't fit in to this white Catholic narrative in the past, you were other. And very much today, you're still seen as other when you don't fit into this narrative. So. This was due to the essentialism of traditional nationalism. It was based upon defining and constantly maintaining the difference between the national group and those outside it. So you defined, you were defined by what you were not and that system of binary opposition. So very much today, you'd see that people very much only recognize you for your color. So when you're walking down the street, what, what do you think is the first thing that people recognize about you? 
do they recognize my gender first or my race? They definitely don't recognize that I'm just a person. So I think that's really interesting. And then direct provision as well and women and young girls. You know, a lot of the times women and young girls can be in very vulnerable positions in direct provision. And I'm going to get into objectification as well soon as well. And just the objectification of black women in particular in society and especially in Irish society where we're seen as just an object. We're seen as people that we're seen, especially by white male as objects that can just be toyed with or just can be easily grabbed or whatever it is so i think that's really important to know as well that again the double burden when you're a woman there's a burden when you're a woman of color there's even more and colorism comes into that as well you know the darker you are the more lesser you're seen in society as well so migrant women as well are as well a part of this as well in terms of in Ireland in terms of the scale and how we look at each individual groups and then Irish women of colour and so on so there is differences when we think about people of colour and women of colour in society there's different grades as we see them and who you know suffers more and more so you know we have women of colour then we have migrant women as well and then we have people as well like myself that you know grew up in Ireland but are of various different origins as well so it's really important to notice all these things and then Beyond Representation is an organization that I founded with my friend and cousin to celebrate women of color in Ireland for our achievements and again there's not enough representation of this and it's something that really needs to change that we give women of color a platform to be celebrated in Ireland and to recognize their achievements because there's so many women of color out there that are doing amazing things and are just not getting enough credit and it takes Samantha Mumba for example actually I recently wrote an article about this that I hope is going to be out very soon and just looking at someone like Samantha Mumba who really was one of the first black women or women of colour to be seen on Irish television and she was had an amazing career as well but I still think didn't get enough credit and I think this is very much down to her race if you look at the other pop stars at that time Boys Own Westlife they were all given a ridiculous amount of credit but Samantha Mumba still wasn't given enough credit even though her success was much bigger than theirs at the time so Sorry about that. So Rachel Baptiste is a black woman who was born in Ireland and lived here in the 1750s. And a lot of people don't realize that black people have actually been in Ireland for so long. And I do feel that she is erased from Irish history because people love to go with the narrative of, you know, black people only came to Ireland in the late 90s when there's inward migration. And that's not true at all. You know, you have to think of our mixed race community as well of Nigerian students that came, for example, international students that came to Ireland to study as well. There's been black people throughout history in Ireland. And Rachel Baptiste is one of them. She was a singer that sang in the Olympia in Ireland during this time. And she's someone to be recognized. So intersectional feminism, essentialism. So we need to realize not to put all women in the same box because we have different struggles that's the bottom line black feminism is third wave feminism that came in the 90s and there was a term womanism that was coined then as well by alice walker so womanism was kind of came as a term for black women to use instead of feminism because feminism was seen as so white and then the double burden that I mentioned earlier as well of, you know, being a woman and then being a woman of colour. And you could add colorism to that. The darker you are, the more lesser you're seen in society as well. 
and the differences in women are race, sexuality and class and disability as well. There's so many differences as well. And the reason why we need allyship, especially in Ireland, is because the discussions around feminism are still very, very white and they're very middle class as well. We're not recognising enough, you know, women that are maybe perhaps even more vulnerable in society as well, you know, in direct provision, migrant women, maybe women as well that, you know, might be students here in Ireland that are alone as well. People don't think about these things as well. And it's really important to realise. Another theorist as well that's very interesting is Gayatri Spivak, who coined the term subaltern. So this term subaltern means a military term which means of lower rank. So she borrowed this term from the Italian Marcus, uh, Marxist Antonio Gramsci. And she really focuses on post-colonialism and feminism. So if you think of colonialism and how they were taking the land, just like how in feminism or in our societies that we, men feel like they own women. So just like those colonizers felt like they owned that land as well. So I think she is a very, very interesting theorist as well. Yeah, and just thinking about allyship as well, in terms of engagements and relationships between maybe black women and white women, I feel like there's always some sort of separation between us. And I think it's something to really think about how many of us truly feel like we can have genuine friendships with each other. And do we feel that race is a barrier to that as well? So this could happen subconsciously as well, that we feel like we're better off having friendships with people in our own race and so forth. So it's something really to recognize. And I suppose this is where the experts come in as well in terms of behavioral, um, behavioral kind of expertise and that sort of thing as well. So I think that's really interesting. And then the future of feminism, we're stronger side by side than against each other. And I think in society as women, we're already controlled by men in society and we're already controlled in terms of our appearance, in terms of what we wear and so forth and so many other things. And then to add race to the mix, it can be very detrimental in terms of us continually discriminating against each other. So it's so important that we stand side by side and realize our differences and realize we need to help each other. And this is where white Irish women come in because white Irish women are the majority of women in Ireland and we need their help to tackle so many issues in our communities. We need to make sure that we're open as well to discussing with other women as well about our issues as well. And I think it's really important to be open to that and to have these discussions on a mainstream level as well is really important. Yeah, that's a bibliography there. And that's my presentation concluded. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ola. That was an excellent presentation. Uh, really, really insightful. Um, I know that there'll be, we have a couple of questions and I know that there'll be more coming in, but I might kick us off um, with the first one. And it was, it's pretty quite clear from your presentation that, you know, we really are stronger together. And there's a, there's a very important element of acknowledging difference um, and supporting each other in that. So, I mean, with that in mind, you know, do you think intersectional feminism really, like, really can teach us about finding a common ground? And if so, where might be the opportunities for that in the Irish context? Yeah, that's the thing. I feel like people don't even know about intersectionality, first of all. And the thing is, people don't even feel comfortable, first of all, even calling themselves a feminist. Like, 
so many people are feminists without even realizing it like my mum for example she would not call herself feminist but she most definitely is because she taught me how to be a strong woman and not to rely on a man so it's very much so more so to do with like we need the knowledge first of all about intersectional feminism i think we should just be calling it intersectional feminism actually because feminism just on its own is very white and very one way and does not include everyone so it's very much about realizing this and having the discussions as well like going forward we need to have the discussions with each other we need to be in the same room together as well I think a lot of us, and this can happen subconsciously as well, we do stick to our own. And I think we need to be more open to having these discussions with the other side, I guess. Excellent, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, and so then, you know, the final question for me is, is I'd love to get your thoughts on the role that, again, intersectional feminism can play in tackling structural oppression um, you know quite specifically in like in uh, whether that could be structural racism but really the systemic issues for women and for women of color in in Ireland sorry could you repeat that just again sure absolutely uh, I'm wondering do you you know what your thoughts are on the role that intersectional feminism can play in really tackling structural oppression like structural racism and structural issues structural inequality for, for women and for black women in Ireland. Yeah, definitely. The two go hand in hand, just like I mentioned Gary Atri Spivak there about post-colonialism and feminism, you know, taking the land, men taking ownership, that sort of thing. So of course, because the thing is, for example, I'm both, you know, I'm a woman and I'm black. You can't take either one on both. And it just intersects all the time. And even to do with hair, for example, that, that's something I should have explained in my presentation. Hair, like black women's hair, that's so topical at the moment. And it's, it's so much to do with race as well, because black women especially are told how to maintain their hair. Oh, that Afros aren't professional, natural hair isn't professional, all this and that. You know, for so many years when I was a teenager in school, you know, I wore weaves, I straightened my hair. There's nothing wrong with that, but I clearly wanted to you know fit in with everyone else who was pretty much white so I felt that by straightening my hair I was taking one less thing out of myself that was different so you know I couldn't change my skin so I could at least change my hair that sort of thing so it's very much about realizing these things as well and realizing the things you do like this for me this is my first time wearing my natural hair on a top ever and that's like a big step for me and it's just like why should it be this is literally the hair that grows out of my head so it's just it's it's interesting to just see how much society has really controlled our minds for so long i thought my natural hair was just like a burden that just was not beautiful as other hair and black women's hair is an art form it is so beautiful it it's so meaningful as well and we just need to celebrate this and to question all the things we've internalized as well about our bodies about our image and so forth that's so true and it's really it's really wonderful to hear you kind of modeling those those uh behaviors for everyone else and for young people in ireland coming coming up and um, because there is a huge there is such pressure to conform to some other idea of what beauty standards are isn't it and uh, you're right in saying that it all you know the post-colonial um our context in ireland is is quite challenging and um, to maneuver but um would anyone else like to come in with some questions i see here that uh lucia um has typed into the chat box that you know separation is the problem um you're saying that why separate black and white feminism um that I think in that way, I think you seem to be alluding to the fact that again, yes, intersectional feminism and working together allyship is where, where it's really important. So thanks for that. Um, Ajid, would you like to come in? Yes, thanks very much uh, for the presenter. Uh, 
I, I'm a man, but I'm very much uh, interested on gender issues, and I've been working on gender issues quite a lot. Uh, I also, I was involved with Akidwa in uh, engaging men uh, in addressing uh, uh, GBV, and um, my own organization as well. I work on gender issues and traveling to Africa, uh, working with women. And I just recently, I'm questioning a lot, even discussing feminism, uh, all the theories, and uh, trying to revisit uh, colonialism. I think uh, while we're celebrating the 20th anniversary of Akidwa, we need to start looking at things differently as well and have a kind of critical mind uh, because we are trying to follow a certain model uh, that have been imposed to us um, directly or indirectly by colonialism. And uh, we put ourselves into that kind of conceptual framework where we try to distance ourselves from our own reality. Um, uh, and yet people still live in that kind of um, paradigm okay, of even conception of the relationship between men and women. Uh, uh, I was following just recently a woman in 80. Uh, she was talking about um, how does she call it? Uh, what uh, African people or people of African descent living in Europe and trying to establish the rapport between men and women. She said, here, we, men and women are opposed. And that's why you talk about all those theories of equality or whatever. And the paradigm in Africa and in looking at even the traditional Africa, it's completely different where there is the notion of uh, complementarity, they, they complete each other, men and women. If you go even beyond the col colonialism or colonization, women were not inf inferior to, to men at all. And you can see even in, even in a lot of civilizations, women, they were the when, the one leading communities or societies, they were the queens. So that notion uh, somehow came uh, with colonialism. I remember um, I was with Salome in Africa where mobilizing women who were victims uh, of violence from the men. And then we came with all these theories from Africa, or from Europe, sorry. And women were looking at us and say, no, 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 no. It's not going to work here that way. So for them, they, they find it completely different. Even here, I talk with women who are victims. Sometimes they fear even to report because they still want to maintain the men, they want to maintain that, that, that completeness of, of this complementarity. So it start kind of, I start questioning myself, what is this now? So I think we are lost. I'm, I'm an advocate of equality of gender. Of, uh, I, I'm, I always fight men who uh, try to treat very badly women. But the, the, the problem here is, we need to start going back to where we were and trying to resurrect those values and reestablish uh, the, the real rapport that uh, is there between men and women. And all those notions of uh, gender equality or whatever will have a kind of different meanings, actually. That's what I think. Now, talking about um, intersectionalism, I completely, agree with you how coming to into that kind of uh, conception where of course women now are victims are very well very badly mm -hmm. um, regarded in africa here and women are discriminated twice because of the the color of the skin and because of being women completely mm -hmm. agree. and thanks very much i really uh, support your ideas thank you thank you Thank you so much for um, the input and also as uh, it's wonderful to see um, a male ally here speak so frankly and openly about, um, the, you know, again, allyship, not just with, with white women and black women, but between men and women as well on this journey of, of feminism and, and feminist approaches to equality. So thank you. Um, Lu Lucia, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrong, but I see you have your hand up. Please do come in. Yes, yeah, I'm sorry. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Um, just want to say congratulations to Ola. You know, that was a fantastic presentation. 
and you know well done to your achievement you know it is definitely you know the things that we ought to celebrate ourselves you know not only for our beauty externally but you know for the achievement that we do career wise as well and you know well, professionally so my question was to you it wasn't just kind of a comment i know that i probably kind of a mix up and there you know so when we talk about feminism and if we go on to look into the definition of the feminism the, the first word that we will find out is you know advocacy all right and you know advocacy of women and then it could be the social the political whatever whatever that comes with this you know when we go to intersection intersectionalism as, as well it's an understanding of a sort of a person it doesn't say a white person or a black person in either of the definition that I was trying to say. So you are in favor of trying to actually separate the feminism. My question to you is, why, why do you feel that we should separate? Because it is a separation that we're trying to block, we're trying to erase. So to, for us to feel equal, for, for us to be feel valued, you know, we have to be, you know, put aside the separation, not to erase our history, not to erase our background or it, 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 it necessity, not, nothing like that. But it's, you know, if we want to be filled that I'm a feminist, like I do, like I'm a Christian and it's very hard to get a, a Christian to declare that, yes, I'm a feminist because immediately they think it's contradictory, you know, but I am and I feel that because like, like most of us African women, we were raised by strong women that make us believe the importance of being independent and self-sufficient, but yet also in the house, how to respect, you know, our partner. So my question to you again is, it, why do you feel the need of separation? Or just to kind of, you know, to, to understand more of why do you, you know, are you pro that, you know, that statement, sorry. Yeah, thank you very much for your comments. Yeah, so I'm not actually in favour of separation as such. I just believe that we need to acknowledge our differences and that's where intersectional feminism comes in. So, yes, intersectional can be used for different issues, not just feminism. But in, sep in terms of separation, we're already separated and we already have our differences. So... I don't feel there's need to beat about the bush and, you know, to kind of say that, you know, all is well and good and we're all the same because we're not. So I think it's really important to acknowledge that. It's not so much that we need to be completely separated in terms of our issues, no. And that's where actually someone like Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie is very popular because she brings all kinds of women together. I went to her talk a few years ago and it was mostly white women there. So it's very much about, I suppose, understanding that we can have separate issues, but to be, be together. And that's why black feminism came in in the third wave, because the mainstream feminism, which is white feminism, was not representing all women. And this is the thing, mainstream is white, it equals white. So we're always going to have to add that extra layer is black women because we're not being represented in the mainstream usually. So it's really important that we do that. And a lot of people say that, you know, that weakens the argument of feminism because there seems to be different categories, but we're always evolving as people, just like feminism evolved into the third wave. And there's a so-called fourth wave now as well. So we're always evolving, you know, it's always changing. And we just need to be aware of that and have that education on that as well. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Yes, yeah, it does. Yeah, par partially. <laughs> just, just to be, you know, to, you know, to be aware of that because when we check it out, intersectionalism in Wikipedia, it will show you white feminism. So that that that's why I was just trying to kind of mm. to to see exactly, you know, why or where you were trying to go. Anyway, thank you very much. I will take more of your time. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks for that question, and Oliver. Um, the uh, the response and what really jumped out to me when you're saying, you know, mainstream does it equals um, it equals white. So it's an a inter really interesting kind of point to make and for us to keep in mind. Um, a couple of other um, comments in the chat box just to share them. Uh, Lena is very happy, very informative. Um, 
we have Sarah who's also really uh, agrees with the statement that some people are afraid of the word feminist um, and kind of tearing that apart and, and breaking it down and understanding what that actually means at its root, as you already explained. And Rosario has a, has a point in the chat box that you might like to jump in, Rosario, um, mentioning that it's, it's sometimes maybe there's a problem with culture. I'm not sure what you mean, but, but do feel free to, to jump in if you would like to on that. Um, is there any other questions for, for Ola? Can I also add as well, like what Ajit was saying earlier about, you know, colonialism being really the issue for how we maybe treat women, maybe in certain African countries and so forth. And I think that's really interesting. I think really, the, to be honest, the issue for that is religion. I think religion is a lot more impacted in African countries than it is here in the West. So I find myself sometimes being in discussions with other white, uh, with white women and they automatically always assume that where I'm coming from, women aren't treated well. And yes, there's problems with women's rights, you know, in Nigeria and other African countries too. But there's so many reasons for this. And yes, colonialism is a part of that, definitely. So I think that's a really interesting discussion. And then Luzia, you were saying as well, like, you know, you're a Christian and a feminist. And thank you for saying that as well, because people need to realize that as well, that you can be both as well. You know, people kind of think you could only be one. and. I think that's a really interesting discussion as well. Definitely. Um, we have a couple more questions that we have time for. So Lena is asking, how can we enable our young girls and boys to accept themselves being African Irish? Uh, and that's definitely, so, uh, I think, very much part of something that you can answer, Ola. Sorry, can you just repeat that again? I didn't get that. Sure, apologies. How can we enable our young girls and boys to accept themselves being African Irish? Being African Irish, yeah. I mean, it's something that you don't really accept, to be honest, as a youngster. Like, I knew I was African Irish always as a young person, but I didn't, I wasn't proud of it because at the time as well, you know, being African wasn't cool. Now it's cool to be African because, you know, Afrobeats, everyone loves that. Everyone loves eating jollof fries. You know, people have these trends on TikTok now of eating fufu and different things. So it's, it's cool now to be African. Back then when I was growing up, it was not cool. So I think times are changing for the better. And I think it's, I think young people feel a lot more prouder now as well of being African Irish. And I think it's just by the little things, you know, by teaching your young kids, you know, your native language as well, letting them be proud of that. And also, you know, the culture, letting them know of it as well at home, even, you know, watching things from your own background as well, you know, whether it's films or dramas or whatever, the music too, engaging in that. And also just bringing that with you as well to school. So I had the opportunities then in school to be able to bring, give presentations on Nigerian culture and, that, and so forth, be able to bring the fashion as well to school and that sort of thing. So advocating for this in schools as well is really important, I think, amongst young people so that everyone can understand each other, that we have different cultures, but we're still, we're still people at the end of the day in terms of that is something to be celebrated and it's something so unique as well that's happening right now in Ireland that we're becoming more aware of this and we feel like we can celebrate it more and be proud of it. So I would be more hopeful definitely for the next generation in terms of celebrating their identity. Brilliant, thank you for that. Uh, we have another comment just saying valid points all round. Um, one person's food is another person's poison. Culture is different, differ too. Thanks for that comment. Um, and Lena, thank you for us answering her question. Does anyone else have any other questions or comments? Roisin, please go ahead. 
Um, hi, how are you? I want to say thanks so much, Ola, for your presentation. It was really interesting. Um, I suppose I was just wondering if you think there is much potential for, you know, uh, women of colour and white women to come together to speak out in Ireland, just because I sometimes worry that, you know, Irish women, women kind of can tend to just sit back and not speak out much. Like we don't have many women in politics. And also, um, like a Spanish friend of mine recently pointed out that we barely even celebrate like the International Day of the Women, the Woman here. Whereas like in Spain, it's a really big day for all women to come together and like protest kind of gender-based violence. And uh, sorry, my camera doesn't always work. But um, I was wondering if you've had many experiences yourself of kind of uh, in Ireland, like uh, women just coming together to recognize and celebrate intersectional um, feminism. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, thank you for that, Roshan. That's a really interesting point you made there. I think with Ireland's history as well of how it's treated women, you know, that kind of shows as well today of how we think of women, how we respect women and so forth. You're right. I guess we don't celebrate International Women's Day enough here. We really should. And the thing is, I think a lot of it, again, has to do with Catholicism in Ireland and how much it has just kind of taken over the country in the past. And that, that still lives on today, you know that's still there that's a legacy so it's very much in terms of changing our narrative changing our thinking and this is an individual thing as well you you need to s almost stop internalizing certain things just like people internalize misogyny we need to start questioning ourselves and s stop you know engaging in our bad habits our old habits as well I think it's very much about having discussions as well, just like this, you know, in terms of intersectional feminism. And again, you know, having discussions between the two groups as well, you know, whether it's black women and white women or, or whatever it is. And to feel comfortable with one another, because again, I said it earlier, you know, how many of us feel like we can have genuine friendships, you know, with other people that are different to us you know luckily I do have many different friendships um with different kinds of women as well and that's great but on a wider scale how many of us do feel like we can and that's that's something that's really interesting again something that is you know subconscious a lot of the time as well so I think it's really about questioning our habits why are we doing this you know questioning inside what are we doing why are we doing this I think is really the way to go to be honest because I've heard in many circumstances even in schools and colleges even in workplace you know people will naturally go to their own kinds of people but it, again why is this happening and in the Irish context as well I find it very interesting like why is it happening so it's something that you kind of need to look into yourself for as well I think yeah what an interesting point, um, because even when you think about psychology and our, the psychology of humans, how we naturally gravitate toward the in-group, but what that means for us in terms of intersectionality and, and allyship and really um, kind of going against those, those natural instincts that some people have. And I think that's a really, really, really important point that you bring up. Thank you. Salome, you have your hand up. Would you like to ask the question? Yeah, I actually wanted to, you know, because this subject has been very much core into my work and I've actually been challenged quite a lot as a black feminist because you see when we talk about feminism as well, um, we, you know, we as black feminists, we have extra challenges because people see us as a, you see those don't care women, those women who want to challenge men and all this, but also like, uh, you know, some of the people have mentioned, you know, when we talk about intersectionality and working with other women, other women has also to, to, to acknowledge us and recognize actually our presence as, as a, a feminist and people who are contributing. But my question to you, Ora, because you're a young woman and actually a woman who have been able to uh, get opportunity into some spaces that most of the women have not been able to go to. How do we encourage more women to get out there and to engage with issues of equality? Because feminism is about equality and rights. And actually, we were to show a video that Arana did in show earlier, that wife, um, 
uh, feminism matters. But how do we lead? Like, you know, this is a struggle. We can't just rock ourselves in our houses and assume that, you know, people will come and tell us to uh, engage and be part and parcel of what is happening in Ireland within the women movement. There are struggles there and challenges there that we understand. How can we lead, like, make a better understanding of this intersectionality of feminism, but also being an engaged with the movement that we have in Ireland because we didn't want uh, the Irish women movement, for example, to be able to engage and acknowledge, you know, the presence of, for example, in particular, black women. How do we do that? Because it's a challenge at the moment. Yes, so it's very much about, thank you again for your question, but yeah, it's very much about bringing one another along. I think as women in general, and because of patriarchy, our society, that we turn against each other a lot. And can I also mention as well, that in African communities as well, here in Ireland, for my example anyway, we do do that. We do turn against each other a lot. And it's very much about enhancing each other, bringing each other along, supporting one another. Because at the end of the day, all we have is each other, to be honest. You know, in the eyes of society, we're all seen as black. We're, ju we're just black. Nobody, I, do you think Irish, why Irish people are looking at who's Nigerian, who's Kenyan, who's Ethiopian, whatever. We're just seen as black. So we need to bring each other together and celebrate one another's achievements and enhance each other because that's what's essential for feminism. It's not to tear each other down. It's to bring each other up, uplift each other. And it's something that we really need to change again inwards in ourselves and it's so essential especially in diaspora as well where we have so many other different struggles the last thing you need is your own kind to turn against you so it's really important that as a community that we cherish each other we hold each other tight and uplift each other and that's the main point i would say to that question yeah a beautiful sentiment, absolutely. We're lifting each other up. Uh, was there, we probably have enough time for one or two more questions before Allah has to leave us. Yeah, Nicola, I was just going to say as well, in terms of like identity and how, like talking again there earlier about like, you know, separation and that sort of thing, I think of, you know, Black Irish, Afro Irish. So there's a hyphen there. So some people might say, you know, why don't you just call yourself Irish? Well, I suppose because there's that extra layer there, again, just like I was saying, of my identity. So you can't take away my blackness. It's very much a part of me. You know, some people might just describe themselves as a person. So maybe I suppose why people would do that. They're just a person. For me, when I describe myself, I'm a black woman, I'm a black African Irish woman, because that's very much shaped my world, shaped who I am today. And it's very much a part of me. You can't take it away from me ever. So it's really about recognizing the different layers in terms of struggles, in terms of identity. And again, it's just important to recognize that because we're all different in society, have different issues that we're tackling. And the more we recognize that, the more we educate each other on that, the more we will be able to actually tackle that because we do need white Irish women's help in doing that because they are the larger population of women here in Ireland. So we really do need that. And I would love even for feminism to be, or intersectional feminism to be discussed and second level, you know, especially in all girls' schools as well. Like, why is it not being discussed? It's really important that we know about it, about the struggles that women have encountered. And also, even in third level, where I did study about feminism, there wasn't enough, again, there wasn't enough about black feminism. I was just learning about theorists, white theorists all the time. I needed to learn about, you know, Alice Walker and so forth. So there just wasn't enough on the curriculum for that as well. So that's really important that we kind of engage in these things and realise that. 
Brilliant, thank you. We have another question in the in the chat box. Um, how can we get the attention of Irish organisations that are supporting women and institutions to collaborate with African women and to share? Um, yeah, let's, sorry, let's stop there. Yeah, so how we can do that is we need to write to them. We need to email them. We need to show them that we're here. So that was one of the reasons for Beyond Representation. You know, if they're not going to represent us, we're going to represent ourselves. So it's very much sometimes about doing it yourself and putting your face out there to them because they won't know that you're there unless you bring yourself to their attention. So even for me in my media work, it's very much about, you know, contacting people, letting them know that you can do this, this, that and whatever. So I know it's not natural to a lot of people, but it is very much about showing the great work that you're doing and you know, pitching that to organizations, whatever idea you may have, and talking to the people inside. You know, a lot of organizations now have diversity leads. So finding out who the diversity leads are, contacting them, organizing meetings, you know, community work as well. That's really important. You know, community work and working together integration as well. So, you know, if you're in a diverse community, you know, bringing everyone together, maybe in a town hall meeting or something, and discussing the issues of that community and so forth so again i a lot of this i suppose it is discussions and going beyond that as well you know action is really important as well so what kind of work we can do as well to better things for people as well in the community and so forth those are some great suggestions while you were speaking what popped into my head was um i was recently had a, a, a media training and it was for supporting women um, to be more involved in media and actually one good suggestion that came out of that as well is if you're if, if you and it, it applies to any type of work that you do if you're asked to do some sort of some sort of work or some sort of or an article perhaps Allah, and you're not you just don't have the time you're not able to then that there is when you suggest your two or three other black female colleagues um, or friends that you, you you know you make sure that you pass pass the book so uh yeah thanks so much for those suggestions yeah it's very much about like leaving the door open as well so you know not having that narrative oh there can only be one you know we have to challenge that that's why we have to like support each other come together to challenge these racist structures that are out there so we can tear them down so we can do that by just one person we literally need to come together and do that yeah brilliant thank you look we've just reached seven on the button so i think um i know that we, we need to finish up shortly um because all i know you have somewhere to you have a, another commitment you're a busy lady <laughs> um but just before you go i mean a huge thank you from from myself and I'm sure from everyone else here for your wonderful presentation and for taking the time to go through so many questions and really offer really insightful and grounded um, responses and, and supports to, to everyone here. Um, I just would like to say as well to, to everyone on the call that if there is the next masterclass session is going to take place next week on Thursday the 27th of May and this will be uh, presented by Dr um Ronnie Lenton and will cover race and racism in contemporary Ireland. Ah, there we have the poster for it. Um, so yeah, I think just a huge heartfelt thank you from uh myself here and uh, obviously the board of Akiba and everyone else. Um and just thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you so up. much for having me. I really enjoyed it. It was a really healthy discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Amelia Thank and Ola. You.